Um, on that note, uh, since they're paying me to be here, plug for Campaign Monitor. I really love working there. Uh, we're hiring. Come talk to me. Uh, but this is actually, this talk has nothing to do with my work. This is a project I've been working on in my spare time. Um, and it is about buses. Here is a picture of a 370 bus. So just to get a show of hands, who has taken a 370 bus? Okay, keep your hand up if that bus was late. <laughs> okay, <laughs> enough said, that talk is over. Um, the 370 bus um, is a bus route that I've taken a lot in my life because it goes past Sydney University where I went to uni. Um, it also goes past UNSW and is one of the only connections between those two universities. It starts in Leichhardt, or it goes both ways, and goes all the way to the beach at Coogee. It doesn't go into the city, but it kind of takes this weird path around the city, and it's quite a long bus route. And the reason I am focusing on this particular bus route is because it is notorious for being a terrible bus route where the buses are frequently late. And if your bus runs every 15 minutes, you shouldn't be able to see three of them together at the same time. <laughs> um, this is a photo, if it's actually really hard to see on this. Um, if you zoom in, you know, enhance, um, you would see that these are all 370 buses, um, and they are all here together at the same place, which means one of them must be at least half an hour late, or one of them is running hilariously early. <laughs> um, and this is not an uncommon occurrence, but of course we can't know that uh, without actually getting data for it. Um, I'm not the only person who thinks that the 370 bus is terrible. <laughs> um, this is a Facebook group which I joined because um, someone else recommended it to me when I was complaining about the 370 bus. Um, there's, it's, it's really fun. They like to joke that like every time the 370 is late, they're actually saving the universe. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, they like to post, you know, you can post pictures of like how late the buses are and make jokes about them. Um, I like this is like, um, services will improve after the release of the new timetable, they say, and someone down here is like, ha, 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 yeah, no. <laughs> um, there are newspaper articles about it, although this one is from 2016, um, so maybe it's gotten better since then, I don't know. Um, but generally, bus times in Sydney are uh, a topic for discussion, and it's generally regarded that they're, they're very late um, and very unreliable, but, you know, no one's released the data for this. Um, bus privatization has become a hot topic recently because the New South Wales government is planning to privatize some of the inner west buses, which may include the 370. Um, they claim that this will make the buses more reliable and more on time. Um, the, bus <laughs> the bus drivers, oh gosh, you can't even see that. Um, the bus drivers would disagree. Um, this sticker is posted in a lot of the buses that you'll see around if you're taking the buses at the moment. It says, bus privatization means fewer stops, less buses, longer journey time, uh, don't sell our buses. Um, so there's some contention there. Here's a Guardian article on why privatization won't make Sydney buses run on time. Um, but ultimately, I was a little bit unsure about this. I don't know whether bus privatization will make the buses run more on time, or maybe it will make them worse. Maybe it won't change anything. Um, I wanted to find out. So basically, I had two questions that I really wanted to answer. One, is bus privatization going to make the buses better or worse? And is the 370 actually the worst bus in Sydney, or do I just think it is because that's the bus that I take, and maybe they're all really bad? Um, fortunately, it's not the bus I have to commute with every day. That's a different bus. It's much better. Um, so I had a look at what data was openly available provided by Transport New South Wales, and they provide a lot of data um, this is deliberately going off the screen, by the way. Um, and none of that data is actually useful for telling me if the buses are running on time or not. Um, so we have like old copies of timetables of buses, routes that don't exist. We can, they publish data on how full the buses are, on how many people are taking the buses and trains and ferries, how many people are using Opal cards, how much, how much people are evading their fares, um, and all these kinds of data, but it was not telling me, are the buses running late? They do not seem to publish this anywhere, not in, even in any kind of aggregated number for the whole of New South Wales, nothing. But this data does exist. They must have this data somewhere because they have this real-time data um, that you can use. If you use buses in Sydney, I would highly recommend using the TripView app. Um, it gives you real-time information on every single bus route um, saying all of these buses, like, when the buses are going to get to your particular stop and how late they are. Um, I actually just, as I was writing the slides, took this screenshot. I didn't deliberately pick one where they're all late. Uh, <laughs> but this is the 370 <laughs> bus route at a random time. 
uh, and all of the buses are, all of the buses on that list are running late. But this is not a government provided app. This is a third party app. Their government, the Transport New South Wales organization must be providing this data somehow to third parties. And conveniently, they are, and it is open, and you can log into the website, get an API key, and start using this data. And it's published in a standardized format that lots of cities around the world are using. And the reason there exists a standardized format is because Google made it happen. Google wrote the uh, spec in partnership with some of the uh, transport agencies, uh, presumably in order to have that data in Google Maps so that Google Maps can have real-time data. And fortunately, you know, different bus agencies and transport agencies have picked it up and used it. So in Google Maps, if the city provides the data, uh, you can see all of the timetable information for all of the transport systems and real-time information about when those are actually going to show up for you, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, it's an open spec, open license. Um, it's actually quite a nice spec. But the problem is, I don't want just the real-time data for now. The only data that the Transport New South Wales publishes is the current data for right now. So for every bus that is currently running now, you can find out how late that bus is um, and for any upcoming stops. Once that bus has stopped at that stop and moved on, that disappears from the data and is gone. So you actually have to collect the data frequently every minute in order to be able to get it. And they have this fantastic like, forum where you can ask questions about the data and they post about outages and upcoming things and that kind of stuff. But if you wanted, say, this other, this is not me, this is someone else, um, it's many more months before I went to look at the forum, um, ask for a historical collection of all of this real-time data that, the, uh, that Transport New South Wales obviously has, um, but they never replied to this message. Uh, so it didn't seem worthwhile me actually asking, hey, can you give me this data? Because they weren't giving it to anyone else. Um, so what I did was I collected the real-time data once a minute for four months. <laughs> um, I didn't sit there clicking it. This was a, a Lambda that did it. Um, so the, there are two parts to the data. There's the timetable information, which is updated surprisingly frequently. Um, there are 20, it's split into 29 different parts for different parts of New South Wales and different agencies. Um, and that was, um, I'll go through a little bit more detail about what these formats mean um, later, but the real-time data um, is a Google protobuf that ranges between about four megabytes and 10 megabytes. Um, and gathering one of those every minute over four months ended up being about 500 gigabytes worth of data. So um, looking into a little bit more detail about these formats, this is how the timetable is formatted. It is a zip file of CSV um, like spreadsheet files where uh, you can kind of imagine that someone had like a database model with like foreign keys and then they dumped out each table as a CSV. It's kind of like that. So there's like a table of bus routes and a table of trips that refer to the route ID of the routes and a table of like what time each trip will stop at each bus stop, which points to the trip ID um, and that kind of thing. So there are a couple of like ID um, codes that we care about in our timetable data. We care about the root ID, um, which is something like the 370 has one ID. There's a trip ID, so the 370 will have um, several different scheduled sequences of stops. So it will go at this stop at this time, at this stop at this time, um, and that trip will be repeated across multiple days. Um, and the stop IDs are also unique. So these are the only IDs that are actually consistent from uh, timetable to timetable. Some of the IDs that link the other um, tables together um, are just ephemeral. They are actually not consistent between timetable versions. Uh, so you have to, so I had to kind of pull this data, normalize it into my own database model, um, and keep that database model in a way that I could, the, the trips would sometimes change. It would keep the same ID, but it would be a slightly different set of stops, or it would be a slightly different timing for those stops. And so I had to keep multiple versions of each of the trips so that I could match up the timetable to the real-time data historically. Okay, this is the real-time data. Uh, so this is kind of a snapshot of the data for one bus that is currently running. So this is the, um, pointing aside, this is the 370 root ID. Um, this is the information for the trip as a whole when the trip started. And you have for any upcoming stops, 
the um, arrival expected time and the delay and the departure expected time and the delay um, for, for each one of those upcoming stops and the stop ID that it's stopping at. Now this data, um, so this is where the trip ID, the route ID, and the stop ID match up with the timetable data, but you kind of have to do that matching manually. So there were a couple of problems with trying to match the real time data to the timetable data. Um, the first one was being that in order to know which trip I'm talking about and which start date, it kind of would be helpful if the start date on the real time data matched the date in the timetable. Um, this was not the case for some of them because if you see how this is the 11th of January at like almost 2 a.m. In the timetable, this would actually be the 10th of January at 25 a.m. <laughs> um, this kind of makes sense because this is the way that timetables are often structured in human readable form. You kind of think of the, the 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. buses as being on the day before and that's the way that they're timetabled. So uh, I don't really mind if they pick this way or the other way to format the data, but it would be nice if it was consistent. Um, it's actually quite hard to work out what day a trip is on any particular stop. Um, so this is a 36 hour time format, um, which is, yeah, which is fun. Um, some other problems uh, were that the stop sequence numbers were often missing. They were just zeros instead of the actual stop sequence numbers that were meant to be there. And so you had to use the stop ID to match that up with the timetable. Um, but because the same bus might stop at the same stop multiple times in their trip, if it's one of the loop services, you then have to actually use this data as well to match up the timing of that stop to that timetable. And since this is the actual time it's expected to depart and the delay, you can subtract one from the other to work out what the original time it was supposed to depart was. Um, that's all fun. Um, Sometimes the trip ID was missing and there were like these extra random unscheduled buses in there, which I guess is okay. Sometimes the trip ID would have this like, there would be extra copies of the same trip running on that day. Um, and they would just append an underscore two to the ID because that's how IDs work, not really. <laughs> um, and the root number, this was the strangest part that I still haven't actually figured out how it happened. Um, sometimes there would be roots in the real time data that actually just don't exist in the timetable. Um, and the script that I had to process these would like dump out all of the missing roots from the real time data. And some of them are like malformed root IDs. The root ID is meant to have an agency number for the bus company running the bus and, a, um, and the root number. But some of them were missing the agency number so I couldn't match them up. And there are these weird, like some of them are obviously rail replacement buses. I guess that's okay, they're not always timetabled. Um, the weirdest one was this 2436 like 994 bus. Um, this is like Hills bus, the bus company is running this 994 and 993 bus, but they don't exist anywhere on the timetable. Um, so <laughs> I suspect it's some kind of like private bus route that's accidentally got mixed up with the public data, but I don't know. Anyway, once I'd worked through a lot of these weirdnesses, um, I had uh, a script that would process all of the real-time data into a format that I could use to make analysis of. Um, and the script would do this. It would download one minute worth of data. It would parse the protobuf. Um, and it would try and match up all of those trips into the trips in the timetable. Um, at peak hour across New South Wales, there are about 7,000 buses that are in flight in any particular time. And this could be up to about 20,000 updates to individual stops along those bus trip routes. And so each processing each minute of data was actually quite a lot of writing to the database um, as well. And when I first wrote this, um, my first iteration of this script took like five minutes to process one minute worth of data, uh, which is not good. Um, I got it down to about 30 seconds to process one minute worth of data on my local machine. Um, and then I had to, to parallelize it. Um, so I would spin up, um, I think at peak I only had about five EC2 instances all running at 100% CPU chugging through the data. Um, but the bottleneck was then writing to the database, which is a Postgres database. Um, and this was again running on AWS, so I had a Postgres RDS instance. And this is the uh, write throughput in megabytes per second um, to the database. Um, and you see how there's like these little jumps, like this is when, um, I went from running like 
there was only one EC2 two instance that was hammering the database, and then I went to like more EC2 instances hammering the database. Um, but that was such a massive bottleneck that the database write latency got up to 400 milliseconds. Um, so this is me upgrading the database. Uh, this is me running out of quota and upgrading the database again. Um, but it did eventually manage to process all like 500 gigabytes of data uh, in a couple of days. Uh, so we then uh, have some results. I've gone through this faster than I expected. Um, so now we can actually look at the data and kind of aggregate it across these four months um, and see how New South Wales is doing. And I would like, before I go to the next slide and show you some of the results, um, oh, actually, before, before we can answer that question, we need to know what, is that, what does it actually mean for the bus to be the worst bus. And since I was only dealing with data about how late the buses were running, I've obviously used a metric about how late the buses are running as a metric for how good or bad that bus route is. Um, so I found the New South Wales definition of what an on-time bus is um, that they use to hold their third-party bus companies to, uh, to a standard. All right, so this is actually built into the contract that New South Wales has with, with bus agencies. Um, it is weirdly, um, a bus is on time if it's uh, no more than 1 minute 59 seconds early and no more than 5 minutes 59 seconds late. It seems oddly specific. Um, and also, they don't measure this across the whole trip. They only look at the start, middle, and end of the trip. So if you planned your trip schedule nicely with a bunch of buffer in the middle, it could run as late as you want in the meantime. Um, and then as long as it reaches that middle point and the end point on time, you're OK. Um, I actually don't really like this measure of quality of a bus, of, of a bus being on time. Um, I prefer the Victorian definition of what a bus being on time is. It says, no table, table bus service operated early at any point in the trip. The bus can never run early. And it should not be, um, let's see, no more than 5% of all bus services uh, will operate five minutes late at any point in their trip. Okay, so the bus can never be five minutes late. Um, and this is, they actually hold their buses to a much higher standard than New South Wales does. The standard that I ended up choosing um, is basically this. I'll define a bus to be on time if across the whole trip uh, it is no more than two minutes early and no more than five minutes late. Okay, This is a bus running on time. If the bus runs on time, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I also wanted to look at the buses being very late um, because in my own experience of the 370, it is not uncommon for it to be more than 20 minutes late. Uh, which is when it starts to really mess with your sense of time and reliability of the bus. If you're expecting to be able to take the bus to go 15 minutes down the road, um, it is very disruptive if the bus is 20 minutes late. So I have two different metrics of what I define to be you know, making a bus good or bad um, in, this, in this process. So if we have the results across all of New South Wales, so ended up with, um, I was going to get you to guess the number before I showed you the answer. Um, there, I calculated um, the on-timeness of about uh, 3.7 million bus trips, and about 31% of them, or about 32% of them, were on time. Which means that for any particular bus that you might take anywhere in New South Wales, you have a very high probability that that bus will run late uh, at some point in the trip. Um, only about 3% of the buses were ever more than 25, well, more than 20 minutes late, uh, which is still a surprisingly high number because you would think that a bus should never run 20 minutes late, um, but it's by no means as bad as the on-time bus. So uh, before we look at the worst buses, let's look at the best bus routes. Um, so it is possible to run bus routes that are 90, 85% on time, like actually on time. They're never five minutes late, and they're never uh, two minutes early across that, that trip. Um, you might also notice that most of these are not in Sydney. They're in other parts of New South Wales. Um, and the ones that are in Sydney are these N buses, uh, which are the Knight Rider buses. Uh, <laughs> and so these are the ones that are operating at like after midnight when the trains have stopped running as train replacement buses. So they don't have to deal with traffic. Uh, so those are the buses that run, run best. Uh, there is... Um, I think the first one that's in Sydney, oh, it's probably, yeah, the Riverwood to Rockdale one. Oh, no, that's a, that's a Knight Rider bus. Uh, <coughs> hmm? Hurstville Grove to Ah, Hurstville Grove to Hurstville, yes. That would probably be the best Sydney bus. Oh, no, there's 
No, the Rockdale one's a Knight Rider boss. I don't know if it counts. Oh, that one. Yeah, no, you're right. Yep. I stand corrected. Yes. So yeah, that is one of the things that came out of the data. Um, the bus trips that the bus routes that are long um, are much less reliable, and that's that's understandable, right? Like the the buses that go for a long period have higher chance that something will get in the way and build up over the whole route to to make it run late. Um, and that's fair. This might be an argument for shorter bus routes. I don't know. Um, the worst buses. Okay, so you might notice that the 370 is actually not on the list of worst buses in New South Wales, at least not on the top 10. <laughs> um, it is pretty shocking that for these routes, like less than, for a lot of them, less than 5% are running on time. Um, you'd think that they would sort of shift the timetable a little bit for that. Um, the worst one is up at Newcastle. The worst Sydney one is Dural to Milsons Point by a cherry book. Uh, which is in the far northwest of Sydney all the way into the city. So that's, again, a very long uh, bus route there. Um, we're going to go to... Oh, and but where does, the, where does the 370 fall on this? It is actually number 22 <laughs> um, with a fantastic, like, 8.8% running on time. Um, this is out of about uh, 5,000 bus routes. So 22 is, like, you know, a pretty good or bad score. Um, but we're going to look at the buses that run uh, more than 20 minutes late. Okay. And our 370 actually gets a pretty good place, like, uh, number six here. Um, what the hell, Wollongong? <laughs> says. Um, this is pretty shocking. Like, if you imagine a quarter of the bus trips are more than 20 minutes late. Right, so on any particular day, you have a one in four chance that your bus is going to be 20 minutes late and your 15 minute bus trip is now going to be 35 minutes. Um, that's pretty horrifying. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that if you actually like, extend this list further, this, this number here of the percent on time is actually an outlier. The 370 is um, actually bad on both lists, um, not just on one of them. So, you know, make of that what you will. Uh, then to the agencies. There are about 19 agencies, and I've only shown the worst 10 here. Um, Hills bus buses only uh, run on time 20% of the time. Um, so in like this goes on for like there are there are 19 agencies. So there's a lot more that are better than the state buses than are worse than the state buses. Overall, you can't necessarily compare them like that because they are different areas of the city. They are different routes. Um, but ultimately, it kind of looks like there's not that much difference in how much the buses run on time between the uh, privatized bus agencies and the state-run buses. It's actually just, it's about the same. Um, and to be fair, the state-run buses operate in the city a lot more than the other ones, so um, they're more susceptible to traffic. Um, so as a conclusion, bus privatization, um, it could go either way. Like it's probably not going to make the buses significantly later or less late. Um, there are other factors to consider there about costs and like um, timetabling and um, routes and stuff. But as, for, as far as running on time is concerned, um, bus privatization is probably not going to change anything. I am going to say that the 370 is the worst bus route in Sydney, just because it had a pretty good placement on both of those lists, and no, none of the other buses had such high rankings on both. This is pretty subjective. Um, you could probably argue that the 277, the Castle Cove to Chatswood, which is the only one that was more than 20 minutes late more frequently than the 370, um, you could argue that one's worse. But I'm going to go and say, yes, the 370 is the worst bus <laughs> in Sydney. All of our hatred is justified. <laughs> um, <laughs> That was basically uh, the project. Um, there's a lot more work that I really want to do. Uh, <laughs> top of the list is trains. Um, so exactly the same real-time data is provide about, provided about trains. Um, I originally chose buses because the trains were generally reliable and the buses weren't. Um, and then as soon as like the, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, for those who weren't in Sydney, uh, the train system basically melted down and there were several hour long delays. And the whole time I was like, oh, I wish I'd been collecting this data as well. Um, but I've only been collecting the device data. I want to start collecting the train data, ferry data and light rail data as well. Um, I haven't done a good job of counting how many times a bus is canceled. Um, and there's also data about how full each of the buses are 
but that is in a different data set, um, which I was not collecting. So I want to collect that data as well. And because this is a standardized format that lots of cities implement, I want to be able to collect this from other cities as well um, to be able to compare and say, hey, look, you know, in this other city, like, for example, some of the European cities, like um, cities in Switzerland or Germany, you can say, well, the buses run 95% on time there. Why can't we do that here? Um, and <laughs> this is probably the part you're laughing at. Uh, I wanted to get the website live for today. It did not happen. So don't go to this uh, URL yet. There's nothing there. Um, but I have bought the domain. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> um, and I've written a lot of the site. It's just not quite ready to go live yet. Um, it's going to be a live updating like list of buses that are running late. <laughs> um, but also, you could go through and see the statistics aggregated across each route. And so essentially making the data open for people to explore and use and do whatever they want. Um, I would really like some help with this. Uh, it's all public. It's MIT licensed on GitHub. Uh, check it out. Um, I do not have a design bone in my body, so I would really love someone to help me with the website. Uh, that would be fantastic. If you are a data scientist or a statistician and you go, ooh, data, this could be fun, I would love to talk to you as well. Um, I don't have a lot of statistics background. Um, and also, the data as a whole, like the raw data is about 500 gigabytes. If you have suggestions or recommendations to me about how I could make this data more accessible to the public, um, I would love to talk to you as well. That would be great. I'll be around all conference. Um, thank you. I think I talked faster than I expected, so there's lots of time for questions. Yeah, um, Katie, you'll need to repeat the question because you guys have been on Okay, yes. Um, it looks like you use Tenoverse like, quite a lot. How yeah. did you go to keep your costs down? Ah, yes. Um, I did use AWS a lot. Did you use the, uh, the question? Oh, sorry. The, uh, it looks like I used AWS a lot. Uh, how did I keep my costs down? Um, so, yes, I did pour a reasonable amount of money into this project. I was already using AWS for my own personal website, this um, like katiebell.net. Um, so it wasn't, I hosted it off the same machine, so it didn't actually cost that much extra, and it's the same database. But the, um, um, the spinning up extra EC2 instances to churn through the data processing was actually quite cheap because I used spot instances, the ones that could potentially disappear at any time, but if I'm just churning through the data in the background, it doesn't matter if they disappear. So they were reasonably cheap, and I could just turn them up, use them for two days, and then turn them off again, and that was reasonably inexpensive. The most expensive part would probably be the RDS Postgres database, um, but I already had one anyway. It just costed, cost a lot of money to upgrade it. Um, I can probably downgrade it now and save some money because I'm not churning through a four-month backlog of data anymore. Um, so overall, like, for both my personal site and for this project, I spent about $200 a month on AWS. Yep. OK, at the back, the front of the two of you. Um, yep. So the, you, you noticed that the, uh, the oh, hi, Russ. are frequently uh, on time. I have very, very good on time. Mm -hmm. Um, I have not done that analysis. That is, oh, sorry. Yes, the, the question was, um, it looks like because the night buses are running on time, whereas the buses that run during peak hour and stuff are not running on time, um, have I done any analysis of the, uh, whether the buses are on time outside of peak time and just very slow during peak time? Um, I really want to do that analysis. Um, that was one of the things that was on my original to-do list that I did not get time to do. Um, but definitely tracking over time what time points are the worst for, for each bus route. Um, this is, I feel like this shouldn't factor into the, the overall lateness of the buses too badly, though, because it's not like peak hour happens at a different time every day or is unpredictable in some way. Um, the bus timetable should account for peak hour traffic, and so I think it's reasonable to hold the buses to a standard saying at all times you should be meeting the timetable. But yes, I would really love to do that analysis of over time, during the time of day, on weekdays versus weekends, like how does that affect the data? Yep. Yes? So you're shaming the 370 bus on the basis that it often runs more than 20 minutes late. Yep. Um, should I go back to that photo where there were three at the same time? Um, 
Yeah, so if they were... Oh, sorry, the, the question was, um, if you're shaming the 370 bus because it's often running 20 minutes late, but if it runs every 20 minutes, is that really a problem because there's actually just another bus there that you can take? Um, that is a great, um, a great point. Um, yes, it does make this... Like, this is a reason that a lot of people still take the 370, even though it is so unreliable. Um, if it was reliably 20 minutes late, uh, then that would be really fantastic. Uh, <laughs> the... <laughs> um, Unfortunately, it's not. Only a quarter of them are 20 minutes late. Um, and part of this is because buses tend to do this bunching effect where because one bus is running late, it gets more people in it, has to stop longer at every stop. Um, it ends up going and has to stop at all of the stops instead of skipping some of the stops because people are getting off. And so a bus that is running late tends to run later. And the bus that's coming just behind it has a really easy time. And so they tend to bunch up together. So a bus that is supposed to run every 15 to 20 minutes, like the 370, uh, ends up running every half an hour to 40 minutes because the buses have actually just bunched together in these times. So yes, I agree. Having a frequently running bus makes it um, a lot more bearable, especially since we actually have access to that real-time data. And you can see before you show up at the bus stop um, when that bus is coming. Um, the other thing, one of the bits of data that I wanted to aggregate over time, but again, I like, ran out of time, uh, the, is the, the wait time for a bus. So it's obviously a lot worse if a bus that runs once an hour is late or early versus a bus that runs every 15 minutes. So uh, I wanted to calculate for each time a bus shows up, or for each, for each scheduled time point, um, if I show up at the bus stop on time, how long do I have to wait for a bus? of any kind, uh, or of the same route, probably. And so this would end up skewing the data to be a quite different story of what a worse bus is, because the buses that run infrequently would then be a lot worse, because if that bus is gone, you have to wait an hour for the next bus, and that's pretty terrible. So yes, again, lots more calculations to do. Um, I think you were next. Um, yes. You mentioned that the 370 was quite a long route. Was mm. there Uh, so the question is, the 370 is a long route. Was there any correlation between the length of the route and the lateness of the bus? Um, I haven't actually done like a correlation analysis, but just from eyeballing the data as to which buses showed up as being the particularly late buses, um, I would say absolutely yes. The long buses tend to be a lot later, but I have not actually officially correlated that. Uh, over here, over the other side. Yes. Ah, right. So the question was, um, as a human, it's very hard to tell the difference between a bus that's 40 minutes late or it's the next bus that's 20 minutes early um, on a bus route that only runs every hour. Um, and can I tell from the data if it was you know, this bus or the, or the next bus? Uh, and the answer is absolutely yes. The data contains the trip ID of each bus that's in the system, assuming the trip ID is there and it's actually one of the scheduled buses. Um, it is in the, in the real-time data, it will label the bus as having been cancelled. Uh, so I haven't actually, um, I haven't modelled that data very well in the data set that I have. Um, that was one of the things that was on the to-do list of like better tracking of cancelled buses. Um, but we can match up, this bus is running this late and we do know that it was this specific bus in the timetable. Yep. Okay, at the back. Just picking people. Um, so the question was, uh, are there any cases of the buses being early? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, the buses are early quite frequently. It's um, part of the reason I didn't kind of focus too much on the early buses is because the um, the way that I had categorized each bus trip into being early and late on on time. Um, the on time buses are the ones that are neither early nor late. Um, it's possible for a bus to be both early and late at different points in their trip. So it might, be, it might have started early, but then got very late as well. So it was kind of getting the stats for that was a little bit messy. Um, but yes, there are definitely a lot of cases of the buses being early. Um, 
the, yes, the answer was, uh, sorry, the question slash answer was like calculating the wait time would factor into that. Yes, absolutely. Um, when I do the wait time, I'm going to assume that the person waiting shows up to the bus two minutes early. But yes, you're absolutely right. If the bus was more than two minutes early at that point, um, and so they miss that bus and they have to wait an hour for the next bus, that will show up in the wait time statistics. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, back over here somewhere. Blue shirt. Yeah. I, I was just wondering if you made any, or had any thoughts about talking to the policy makers. Ah. So the data, because it's quite damning, really. And, you know, I guess that's the next. Um, yeah, so the question was, um, have I thought about talking to the policy makers and showing them the data? And um, my, this is a large part of the reason I want to do the bossshaming.com website. Um, basically, if I can get that out there in a way that people find entertaining um, and it becomes a, a topic that the public are talking about and data that the public have that then everyone as a whole can go to the government and say, hey, look at this, this is pretty bad. Um, that would be really good. That's actually like a large part of the reason that I want to do this is to have that data out there so it can become part of that public discourse. Um, I was contacted by a journalist um, based on my talk abstract in the schedule. Uh, so there may be an article coming out about this, which is kind of scary. Um, so yes, that process has started. But I haven't actually contacted any government agencies to, to talk to them. Yeah. Uh, Rachel. Uh, oh, sorry, Rachel at the back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I didn't catch that question. Oh, um, the question was, why did the Stockton Ferry turn up as a bus? Um, I actually didn't notice that. <laughs> I, I had assumed that that was a bus that happened to go to the ferry, um, but I actually don't know. Maybe it is a ferry that's been included in the bus data. <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I can look into that. It was the, there is, um, Transport New South Wales provides separate feeds for um, buses, trains, light rail, and ferries. And I've only been scraping the bus data. I haven't checked the ferry data at all. So there's no chance it could have accidentally gotten mixed in there unless it was Transport in New South Wales doing that mixing. Uh, so maybe they treat it as a bus according to their own categorization. I don't know. Um, sorry, the person who thought it was a question last time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you didn't calculate yet, or I wonder if you want to calculate, uh, compare, you know, every trip mm -hmm. as a combined measure to say, um, uh, uh, so that you can say, ah, trips that happen between these times mm -hmm. are bad and after that is good. Okay, so the question was, if I understand correctly, um, I seem to treat like every route, every bus route as sort of a single entity. But, but from beginning to end, like according to different times of day, like when are all of the bus trips being late? Um, that would be a really great analysis to do. I haven't done any of those sort of split over times of day uh, analysis yet. Um, but again, I have a lot of data now that I can play with. Um, I, I would love to see like a graph of the buses are peak at like you know, the morning peak hour and lateness across all of New South Wales or all of Sydney, um, and then they peak in the afternoon. Um, oh, you are. I mean, yeah, I'd love to talk to you. That would be great. Yep. Um, we have more time for questions because I talked really fast. Yes, Vivian. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was, did I consider how infrequent the buses are, like in, infrequent versus frequent buses in, in the data? In so that, so like, um, let's say there's only two bus trips late, mm -hmm. really late, but there might be only 20 or like, there's not that many. Right, there's not enough bus trips to have yeah. for the data to be significant. Yeah. Yes. Um, actually, that is a really great question because I think I failed to mention that because I had planned to mention that, but I didn't. When I was calculating the, the best of um, and the worst of bus routes, I limited it to buses that had enough trips to be significant. So if there were buses, buses that wouldn't, so that was a, um, I think the threshold I set was about 500 
bus trips in, in the four months, which means that it would need to run at least twice a day um, in order to be included in the stats. So there are some incredibly infrequent buses. And the reason I did, who, which are probably later, but I, it's hard to tell if it was just that particular sample of data or not. Um, the reason I did this was partly because I wanted to focus more on the Sydney data. And most of those buses that are very infrequent are the regional buses that do very long distances. And they only run twice a day, so they, or once a day. So um, if it's very late, it's actually not, um, it's not as significant generally because, you know, oh, if I'm taking the bus to visit my grandmother once in a while, then that's, I don't mind if it's 20 minutes late, but if it's a bus that I take to commute every day, then I do care that it's unreliably 20 minutes late. Yeah. Um, you've had your hand up for a long time, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, sorry, so two questions. One, um, uh, what's the story with, uh, with traffic data? Have you found any good sources? And two, um, could you maybe talk about the licensing of your data sources? Like, okay. are there any onerous terms, just off the real time sources? <laughs> okay. Um, so the, wait, the first question was, um, have I looked at the traffic data? Oh, sorry, so for dealing with anomalous events. Oh, okay, so like, like unusual spikes yeah, of, exactly. of traffic. Yeah, like um, when you're in Sydney Olympic Park, if there's an event, it might cause public transport to run off time. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. The, uh, I don't, I haven't looked at any particular traffic patterns or traffic events and how that affects the data. I'm sure it would show up for, for if there's a particular spike in traffic for some event, then it would definitely affect the buses and I'm sure it would show up, but I have not looked at that. Um, what was your second question? I'm sorry. Sorry, so uh, licensing terms. Oh, the licensing terms of the, yeah, the licensing terms of the real-time data. Um, I actually don't remember. So when I first started this project, I went to Transport New South Wales Open Data and read the license, um, or at least skimmed the license, and decided that what I was doing with the data was within the terms of the license. Um, I haven't gone back to double check that, um, and I don't remember under what license the, um, the, the license is definitely allows you to republish like the data, like TripView does, um, basically wholesale. Um, but, and I didn't find anything in there that said I wasn't able to like aggregate that data um, or republish that data. So um, I believe it's okay. I am not a lawyer. Um, maybe if you know if this, this journalism thing happens, then maybe I should get a lawyer to look at that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are very short on time. Uh, maybe the questions that uh, actually we have two minutes left. Um, I feel like questions have gone on for a long time though. Um, any urgent questions? I've been sitting here waiting with a question for a while. Yes. Okay. Ah, yes. Um, so the question was, am I able to capture the number of buses that zoom past because they're full and they don't stop? Um, with the data that I've collected so far, no. I thought that my data would um, include the fullness of the bus. So the format specification has this like enum of the bus is empty, the bus has people in it, the bus is full, the bus is um, crushed, I think was the word that they use. Like there's, there's uh, <laughs> There's a, there's a badly full like, level in this. And so it's very coarse grained data, but you can actually see, is the bus too full to pick up passengers? Um, unfortunately, there are two separate real-time data feeds. One is the trip updates, which is the one that I've been gathering. And the other one is the GPS vehicle positions of each bus. And that is the data that includes the fullness. So I don't have that data, but I can get it. Yeah, uh, that was all of the questions, I think. Um, so thank you. Oh.